What do you say we get started? All right. Welcome, everybody. My name is John Mayer, and I'm the executive director of CALI, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. Uh, if you haven't, if you haven't uh, told us of your attendance, there's a link that uh, Elmer will drop into the chat one more time, but you know, it keeps on scrolling by, we know. Um, and, uh, or follow the link if you can type all that, that's on my screen right now. All it requires is your name and your email address. We're just trying to find out how many people you know, have actually showed up um, for, for this. So I've got a few things to, uh, to do housekeeping wise and then, we're gonna, then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Deb and Tanya um, and we'll go from there. First of all, um, um, oh my gosh, thank you all for showing up. Um, there's, an, there's an interesting thing about the fact that you showed up. Uh, we believe that there's going to be a lot of online teaching this fall and you 600 uh, that I can see, as well as maybe over 900 people registered for this class have all said, I wanna learn more about this online teaching so that I can be a better instructor this fall. That's awesome, that's fantastic. I, I, I laud you on that. And, that, and your willingness to learn. I want you to take this class, this course seriously. We're, we're gonna do uh, the best we can to give you uh, a, a good course. And so let's take it from there. So the course website, as you all know, is at onlineteaching.classcaster.net. We, we, if, you, if you saw during the, the process leading up to this, we went through some iterations on that. Part of that was driven by the fact that there are so many people. I honestly thought maybe we'd be have, talking to maybe 50 or 75 people here. I'm blown away that there's uh, over 900. We will be sending emails at intervals for the next Zoom link or whatever that is, um, uh, as well as posting things on the discussion. There's a discussion board for this, and each session has its own topic at community.cali.org. You have to be registered at cali.org. In other words, you have to get your authorization code from your school and, and register there, and most of you had to do that before you registered, although some of your late, your later registrants, um, uh, we, we skipped that step just, just to get things uh, moving again. Um, I hope this course gives you some verisimilitude on, on what it's like to take an online course. And what that means is there will be glitches. Uh, you, will, you, will, you will learn about the meta, meta production issues around online uh, courses. And, uh, and, and as always, we ask for your patience with our, with our glitches. For us, this is, uh, not this is emergency remote teaching for us or emergency remote online teaching. And it's, and it's even more meta than that. It's, it's emergency online remote teaching about distance learning. So it's um, highly likely that some of your fall 2020 teaching is gonna be online, right? Either you're, you're Harvard and all of your classes are online or you're thinking that maybe some of the classes will be online or some of the students will be online because they're immunocompromised or some of the faculty will be online because they don't wanna come in and, and, and be uh, in danger of, um, of the pandemic and things like that. And so learning about how to teach online is a, is, is a skill, it's a muscle, it's something that you have to practice. Um, and, and I believe that online classes can be as good, if not better than face-to-face -face classes. They could be more accessible because of things like you could watch the video and pause it. You could speed up or slow down the video. There could be captioning. You can listen and watch. They could be more interactive because you're already on the computer. And so you could give people polls. You can put them into breakout rooms. You can send them off the Cali lessons. Um, and I think it could be more convenient because you don't have to travel. You don't have to park. Um, you don't have to uh, haul your books around um, if, it's, if everything is online. So there's a lot of reasons to learn about this, this capability. So let's start with a poll. There's a, there's a poll at instapoll.cali.org and it's, you type in the number 7044 and answer this question. A, if I'm a little concerned about fall semester, B, I'm freaking out, or C, I'm not worried, I just want to expand my skills. So I'm gonna alt tab over to Instapoll to make sure that that's up and running. Where's my, there it is. I gotta go to Instapoll. And folks are starting to answer already. So I'll come back to my slides. So 
so you can see the question. So choose, so you go to instapoll.cali.org, you type in the poll number 7044, and then click on A, I'm a little concerned, B, I'm freaking out, C, not worried, just want to expand my skills. We'll give you another, oh, minute or so. And that will give me an opportunity to pull up the Q&As and maybe see if I can uh, answer a few. Here's an interesting question, Elmer. Is there any important difference between Q&A and chat? And the answer is yes. So Q&A is literally a question and answer. Uh, for, uh, the interface that we get is that we can click to answer live, we can type an answer. Um, people can vote up questions and so it will sort the, the questions that other members of the audience see uh, higher, higher up. Um, it's not much more sophisticated than that, but even those small amount of uh, capabilities are, are pretty cool. Can't access poll number 7044. Hmm. Let me go over to Classcaster. Sorry, over to Instapoll. I see 154 of you have gotten into that. Um, what I'm gonna do is do an incognito window. See, I can't, because I'm running this poll, I can't run, I can't participate in a poll unless I do a, uh, an incognito window. So I go to instapoll.cali.org and I wait for my browser and hope that, that, that I didn't just lose connection. You can still hear me, right, Deb and Elmer? Good. Yes. All right, then I'm having like a different problem. Maybe Instapoll is just uh, over overcrowded because I said I'll oh, send 800, 700 people there all at once. <laughs> I'll bet that's the problem. <laughs> ah, there we go. It, it, it figured it out. So 7044, join poll. It's taken a little bit. Sam will be very happy to see that there's uh, 700 people trying to answer a poll at once. We've never had that many people use this tool all at once because it's, uh, it's, it's built for like a classroom like situation. So if I remember A was, uh, I'm a little concerned about fall, B was I'm freaking out and C was, I'm just here to learn. I'm gonna help the C's out and click C. All right, and now I can hide that and see that 244 of you have answered. So, so from the results here, you can see 47% um, oh, are, are in the, um, all right, I'm a little concerned about fall. 17% uh, of you are freaking out. Thank you for your honesty. Um, and uh, about 35% of you, 36% of you are, um, you know, just here to learn and expand your knowledge. That's great, that's great. All right, let's take, let's, let's, let's take a second poll. I'm gonna go back over there. I'm gonna clear those responses. And now here's the second poll. So stay on Instapoll and now you answer again. This fall, my school is A, 100% online, B, some online, some face-to-face, -face, C, all face-to-face -face with appropriate measures being taken, or D, you don't know. You've been getting mixed messages. Which one of those is your situation right now? So 100% online, mixture of the two, B, all face-to-face, -face, you're going back, no, no, no pandemic's gonna stop you, or D, you don't know or there's questions about that. And now we can watch in real time the answers here. And we're seeing uh, quite a few folks don't know, not surprised um, with uh, the next biggest one being um, uh, B, which is some online, some face-to-face. This is neat. This is working very well for us. I was a little concerned that Instapoll couldn't handle this level of load. I know some of you are probably getting uh, either slow responses out of your browser or, or it's, uh, it's timing out or something like that. But for the most part, I just wanted to get a sort of um, a read of, of this. So thanks for doing that. Uh, I got to go back to my PowerPoint. Good. All right. So this is being done by, this is, this is the, 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 in case you don't know who Cali is, I'm gonna, I gotta give it, I gotta give it at least uh, 30 seconds. 
um, because an awful lot of you are showing up and you may not have known much about Cali, but we're a consortium of US law schools. Like 96% of all law schools are members. Um, I hope your law school is a member. We're, we're, we were started over 38 years ago by the University of Minnesota and Harvard. Um, and we're uh, funded by law schools. You guys pay annual dues that we use to uh, produce lessons. We have over a thousand rigorous interactive self-paced tutorials that you should be using in your distance learning, in my opinion. We also pay people to write case books and give them away for free. The goal there is not so much to save money, uh, but for you to be able to remix and repurpose you know, entire case books for however you want to teach. Uh, which means you can download the Word version. Um, you can also buy a paper copy of the book at cost. It's like 12 or $15 for the paper book. Uh, we wrote A to J Author, which is used for court form automation and experiential learning for law students. Um, and uh, you know, if you didn't hear about any of those, you might've heard about Cali Awards for the students who get the highest grade. You might've attended CaliCon, which was just last week. Um, hopefully you're starting to hear about things like QuizWrite, which is our multiple choice question author, Cali author, which we use to write lessons, Classcaster, which we're using to run the course website here, um, Time Trial, which is a game that we're working on. Um, and I always forget other things uh, uh, to remind people about, but more about that later. Oops, I hit the back key. So it all comes from Corona, right? Think this is what we did when Corona hit. We, we, we noticed that a lot of people were sharing resources. So we put up a page at Cali.org slash Corona that tried to curate some of those resources. That's still there. This is aging though, um, but we're looking to uh, make this a better resource going on into the fall. Um, I, did a, I did a survey or a poll that, that, that's still open by the way, uh, asking people if they wanted to be guest speakers in your courses. We had over 90 people who volunteered to do that. Um, and I know at least a few of them got called and contacted. We're also looking to improve on that for the fall. We have two surveys out right now, the Emergency Remote Learning Law Student Survey and Remote Teaching Law Faculty Survey. If you haven't taken that survey, please do. We'll, we'll drop uh, links in the chat or, uh, or post them on the, uh, on the community forum. We had a conference last week and this was a pivot uh, the entire conference was on the topic of pandemic, legal education, and technology. Uh, but just closed up on Friday. Uh, we should have the videos of that posted in another week or so. Um, some awesome sessions, student voices, uh, techie, nerdy stuff, um, advice for teaching, all kinds of great sessions that you should check out. We also like to have fun at our conferences. That's me both being uh, Business John and um, uh, the great and powerful uh, John, uh, as I was uh, emceeing this. Um, I, I always, I, I feel like I got to emphasize that, that we're serious about the work we do, but we also like to have fun with the work we do. We, we realize that it's, you know, all, all, all work and no play makes us boring. So the emphasis, the reason why this course came along was we thought, well, what can Cali do and what do faculty need right now? And our answer was faculty need some training or some, some, some clues, some techniques for how to do online learning. And that's what this mini course is. Um, we've scrambled fast to put it together, uh, but I think we've got an excellent lineup of folks and activities for you. Uh, like I said before, we want you to take it seriously. We have fairly limited, but realistic goals. We want you to be stimulated, which is to say, we want you to be looking at these ideas, seeing if they work for you or thinking about how you might find other ways to do things that improve your distance learning. Um, and the second big goal is we want you to have empathy for your students. Uh, you're taking the, the meta goal here is you're a student now, you are now experiencing what your students experienced in vast number of, hour, number of hours. And so uh, hopefully we model a better way of doing distance learning through this course, as well as the content of the course. At least that's the goal. Like I said, we have over 900 registrations. We're overwhelmed. All of our, all my emails are, are overwhelmed, but we're trying to get back to you and get things up on the website. You know, we'll be putting things into the FAQ to, to mass answer questions and such. We are recording everything, so they will be posted. So if you have colleagues that are like, I didn't make it. Uh, they, they can watch and learn and uh, play along at home as well. 
your instructors, uh, which is to say your, your course administrators, uh, I'm not sure what to call us, uh, is Deb Quintel, our Director of Curriculum Development, Elmer Masters, Director of Tech, and me, your, the Executive Director of Cali. I put our emails on there because um, you already have them, but if you have any questions or things that you want to ask us, don't hesitate. Um, expectation management though is uh, we're, we're jammed with, with lots of you asking those questions, which is awesome, but give us time to respond. It's not that we're ignoring you, we're just uh, overwhelmed. Um, so, so my last thoughts before we get to Tanya, um, I, I want you to nurture curiosity during this. Think about how these things will work or how something like this will work in your own setting. Um, we can't create a canned course that will work for everybody in exactly the same way because you're at 200 law schools teaching 200 different classes. There's 40,000 variables uh, just right there. Um, as you know, you have to have a higher tolerance for glitches if you're online. Um, there's a thunderstorm rolling by as I watch. I'm in Springfield, Illinois right now. Um, and I think Elmer's in the middle of uh, the edge of a tropical storm as well. Um, and, and that's only the weather, you know, there's all sorts of other things that can go wrong. There's no one right way to do this, you know, make small improvements and iterate. Um, I wanna emphasize that live lecturing like I'm doing right now is good for a little bit, but it's not good for an hour or two and for uh, three or five hours a week for 15 weeks. It's, it's, it's fatiguing, it's, the raw, it's not the best way to transfer information. Um, and hopefully you'll learn some other techniques in this. Uh, you have to work a lot harder to connect, to connect to the students in online learning. You gotta be watching them closer than you can watch them with your eyeballs in the classroom. Um, and there are methods and ways to do that, formally called form formative assessment or educational analytics. And finally, the last one is, there aren't enough of us to, to answer all of your questions here at Cali. Um, and, and, and I would encourage you to find and give support to your colleagues and create your own support groups. Um, we hope that the bringing of you together in this class helps you to find your, 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 your colleagues, your guides, people who are teaching the same thing, people who are, do, who are interested in the same areas. And you can form your own groups that like get together once a week on Zoom or, uh, or use the, uh, the, the community forums to get some of these things done. I've gone on way too long now um, and I'm done, but that's what happens when you start the class. There's always a bunch of uh, throat clearing and housekeeping. And uh, let me turn this over to Deb and Tanya. Okay. Um, well, I, I want to welcome uh, Tanya. I first uh, read her papers a number of years ago um, and at the time was just blown away by what she had to say about teaching in the online world. And when we plan, started planning this course about a week ago, it seems like a week ago, a month ago, I just haven't slept in a week, sorry, a month ago, um, I immediately thought, who do I want to bring into the law community that you all may not know as one of our typical speakers at law professor events? And immediately thought of Tanya um, and wrote her um, one of my best fan letters ever. Um, and, and she agreed to speak to us. Um, her bio is listed off of our, our course page and I, I really would invite you to read it. I would invite you to go to Amazon and purchase her book. I would invite you to go and follow the links on her website because she has amazing resources for all of us. Um, and so I'd like to turn it over now to Tanya if it would and, and please uh, educate and uh, bring us up to speed here. Thank you. Great, thanks Deb. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen here and bring up the presentation for today. Can everyone see that okay? Yes. I'm not gonna, um, because I'm sharing my screen, I am not able to see the chat as well. So you guys can all, um, Deb and John can chime in where I need be. But I wanted to talk a little bit today about creating a successful online course. And I do have to say, um, I do lots of these events, but Deb's email was, uh, no matter what she said, I was going to do this event because I have never had somebody have so much background information about my work. So, and that's always really nice. So we're going to talk a little bit about creating a successful online course. I've taught online for almost 20 years and I spent probably 
about 15 years ago, developing uh, resources to support other faculty in designing blended and online courses and, and going to share some of those stories and experiences with you today. And hopefully that'll inform some of your plans for the fall. So uh, we received a large grant from the University of Wisconsin system um, a long time ago to bring groups of faculty together to sort of explore using technology. And at the time, we were looking at blended or hybrid learning. Um, we actually still have a hybrid website up from our 2002 grant project at hybrid.uwm.edu. But later we changed it to blended learning. And it's interesting because I see hybrid is making a resurgence here with everybody as well as high flex. But when we brought a bunch of faculty together and exploring how we design our courses, these were some areas that we had identified. And so I'm sure all of you in planning for your fall courses, in particular, if they're gonna be blended or hybrid or online, um, you're trying to think about um, these different areas and what you need to do. There is a resource you can find on my blog at professorjuston.blogspot.com and I can share it with Deb to share with you. It's called the 10 questions for redesign. Um, we made one for blended and then um, online. And then also I have one for those of you who are doing massively online open courses as well. But it's just sort of the 10 questions that we need to start thinking about and considering in these areas when we are going to be, traditionally what we talk about is like, oh, we're gonna put a course online um, or put things online, but really you sort of have to rethink your whole course. We call it more a transformation that, uh, that you're gonna go through when you're pivoting to online more than you are just sort of putting your traditional course and just moving it online. So we need to think a little bit differently about that. Now, as I heard John commenting about lecturing, it's interesting because delivering content tends to be the number one thing. And it might be the only thing that you're thinking about is how do, what do I do with my lectures? How do I give my lectures online? Or just more in general, how do you deliver your content online? Now, in the past 20 years, we've also had a significant amount of research done in this, which a lot of people just aren't familiar um, because, you know, you're probably reading law journals and so forth, and you're not reading, um, you know, the American Journal of Distance Ed or the Online Learning Journal or um, know that there's a whole discipline out here that researches this stuff to help guide us. I'm actually from the field of communication. Um, I teach organizational communication and technology. Um, and organizational change and those sorts of things. So um, just sort of stumbled into this area. So delivering content is a number one concern that you all have. Um, another concern that I think is in you know, particularly important when we talk about um, quickly going online or remote instruction or just our response based on COVID which is something I did not think about in the beginning. You know, in the beginning, I was like, how do I deliver my lectures? And I have 32 classes and, you know, maybe about 28 lectures. I have three exams. You know, that's how we were taught. We sort of take on that pedagogical approach. We call it the teacher-centered sage on the stage approach. You know, we didn't know any different. I think also 20 years ago, we weren't thinking about how effective was our teaching or was everybody learning? Now that's sort of changed a little bit because we see decrease in enrollments and we wanna make sure that every student succeed, we're not just weeding out. So I thought a lot about delivering content and the other thing I didn't think about for probably a few semesters was, what do I need to be doing to support my students? I should probably give in, um, you know, cause I see students having some similar problems semester after semester, I should probably take some time and help them out. And when we moved to remote instruction, I felt like this was a really key point. So these are just the first two things I would like to talk about briefly. So when we talk about um, supporting our students, the so research tells us that there's five areas that are important. Um, we just published an article, uh, myself and one of my colleagues in the online learning journal, that actually collected data from different institutions and linked these to student outcomes. So, you know, I told you we came together with this like group of faculty and we're like, these are all the areas we need to think about, especially if we're gonna you know, help other faculty um, get ready for teaching online or blended. And um, we are always doing these things, but I started thinking like, what really matters? You know, We have so many things we have to pay attention to, what really is impacting student outcomes? And so that was um, that research, we collected data from 2016 um, to 2018 over five semesters. Um, again, at two-year and four-year universities, 
And so um, what we came up with is these are the different areas in supporting your students. Now, one of the big things, um, there's a whole sort of emerging research area around um, triage, um, learning and emergency learning and those sorts of things. And just that, you know, um, or they call it trauma induced instruction. No, trauma based instruction. <laughs> we love to take things from the medical field, I feel like. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot going on in our society. And so um, that are impacting our students and are impacting us. And I know you know, when we first moved to remote instruction, we weren't thinking a lot about the fact that faculty were gonna be ill and students were gonna be ill or students um, were going to have children home with them um, since the schools were closed and we don't know quite what we're going into the fall. So I've said before um, COVID that it's always good. I feel like my online classes are sort of a partnership with my students and that um, there is a sense of sort of a be forgiving of myself and be forgiving of them because sometimes things get jumbled a little bit online. But I'd really express that um, we need to have empathy for our students. Um, we know from our research, actually, students want to know that they care, or that you as instructors or faculty care about their learning and care about them. Um, we also know as far as research on diversity and higher education that we need to have more flexibility. And we also know from our research that clarity or ease of learning is important online. So a lot of times, like John was saying, you know, you come into an online class and you're trying to get through some things. Those are extra important when you're online. When you're face to face, we're used to just sort of walking in and taking care of business matters. And we sometimes don't create an opportunity for us to do that online. So that's really important too to sort of unpack those expectations and have some clarity. So you need to make sure that you're frequently communicating with your students, that you're orienting them not only to the course syllabus, but also to the design of the course and the technologies that are going to be used. You have to really unpack your expectations about the course, what they're doing, why, why they're doing it, how that aligns with the learning objectives. Uh, and then also you need to make sure that whatever technology that they need is accessible. I think a lot of times we tend to use high risk technologies. Um, like Zoom, um, video chat, um, lots of you were talking about the challenges that you were having and some of the tools. So although sometimes we say those technologies and different functions and tools are really sexy, sometimes you just wanna stick to the standard, reliable tools that you know are gonna work or at least have a plan B in case you have technology failure. And then also making sure that things are accessible. We find that for example, having um, captions or having scripts of your lectures and those sorts of things, they're not just for people who have a potential impairment or a disability, they actually improve learning for all students. And, and I'll talk about that just a little bit. So um, I talked a bit about supporting students and you can refer to those articles if you want more details. I have some resources at the end for you as well. The other thing is delivering content, as John talked about in a lot of people in the entire country, and I think um, I was quoted in the Chronicle of Higher Ed about sort of a Zoom university, and then they came back again because that's how uh, prevalent of a topic it was, um, because everyone moved right away to a synchronous video um, tool in order to replace their face-to-face -face time and we started realizing there's a lot of challenges um, and it's not so easy to just log in um, for an hour or hours um, and get the same sorts of outcomes maybe you do in the face-to-face. -face. Uh, we also know that um, when we're talking about delivering content, um, sometimes uh, synchronous and video chat is not necessarily the tool you need. It really depends. Um, we, there's a whole area of research. Some would say it goes back to the 1930s. I know some of the first studies that I've read are in the 1970s, um, which is in an area of uh, human computer interaction or computer mediated communication. And so they talk about you know, what you're trying to accomplish in your organization, in your workplace, and what medium you should choose to do that. And so you know, when you're at work, you don't do everything face to face. Um, you don't walk over um, to ask somebody, you know, a question about something. You're okay with emailing it because, you know, that technology is appropriate for the task. Um, and so you need to think about what are you actually trying to do in your class? What is your pedagogical task? What is the instructional task? And then think about which technology or which medium face-to-face -face or online 
is best for that. And that's in particular uh, of a particular importance when you're talking about blended learning, because a lot of that is deciding which environment is best um, for whatever you uh, learning activities your students are doing. And I think a lot of times, um, a lot of us are situated in sort of the teacher-centered lecture-based model. Um, there's a lot of research over the last couple of decades that have told us it's actually an ineffective method. Um, those sorts of methods, obviously we can go back to um, Socrates and Aristotle and Plato. Um, hopefully we've developed a little bit since then. And I know everyone's got an argument for why it's the best. I've heard them all before. Um, but I think in starting to think about um, the fact that we have neuroscience now and learning science research that says that individuals cannot retain information after 12 minutes. And so um, we definitely cannot be lecturing for 50 minutes and think that our students are going to retain that knowledge moving forward. I think some of the learning scientists are really great when they say, you know, students are not empty vessels waiting to be filled with knowledge. Um, we know that learning is best when it's scaffolded, when it's learned through experience and, and all of these sorts of things. So we got to think a little differently about that. Um, lots of people have a uh, Zoom available to them, but you also have to think about uh, bandwidth, obviously number of people that are going to be attending sessions and how those things. In the beginning, I was like, yeah, I'll just video all my lectures. This will be great because you have to see my totally non-purposeful hand moment or have movement to get what I'm saying in this message. And I started uh, realizing, one, talking to a computer is really rough. I am so not charismatic at it. Um, also, I didn't really have a camera team um, to record me at the time, and it was very expensive. You know, at least now we have tools, video conferencing tools, but again, they shouldn't be your whole learning experience. Um, and it comes down to what skills you have. You can turn this on, but also it's quite easy these days to record things as well. This is a matrix that we put together a dialectical continuum from least space um, richness, or we call it leanness more or less, of media all the way to the right, which is richness. And, and you guys can refer to this, but sometimes you can think about, is this information my students can just read? Do they really need to hear me talk about it in order to understand it? A lot of information, and we know from the research that text only and text plus images is usually fine uh, level of leanness of media for students to comprehend what you're trying to tell them. Um, they don't necessarily need to see it coming out of your mouth to understand. But there are points where we do need audio and visual um, content. Um, when we're talking about something that's really complex, um, or maybe there's a story or a context that goes along with it that we need to provide, then we want to move to the richer media. So just letting you know, there's some other considerations in thinking about when you start delivering content online. I spent in 2007 an entire summer recording lectures. I thought they were going to be amazing. Um, my students were going to be so connected to me. Um, they were going to, um, I was going to do research on it. I did do research on it. It was going to greatly impact their learning and their satisfaction. They were going to think that we were more connected um, because I do a lot of research on social presence and engagement. And I found out that was not really the case. The students really liked the transcripted lectures. They liked being able to read them because they can read faster than listen. They liked being able to highlight and annotate. So later I, I saw this presentation about audio and video introductions to materials to sort of provide context and give a little uh, meta learning, um, you know, give them a little emphasis about what you think is important and those sorts of things. And so um, I, then decided to record these audio introductions for all of the units and modules in my course and went back. So when I did the um, audio lectures, I should mention it was like less than 40% of my students wanted everything in that format. Move forward, 100% of my students wanted the audio introductions. So that was my little lesson with that. Um, and actually looking at the research on different types of media and how it impacts learning. Um, the meta-analysis that we see actually says that text plus images is the only statistical significant impact on learning. Um, so how my course runs is on Monday of the first week of the module, they get an agenda. Again, I have a recording with that to sort of unpack my expectations, talk about what's important. Um, and then they have reading and lecture available. The lecture is in text-based as well. Um, and so the audio introduction is available there as well. 
Um, I have done audio introduction for a long time more than video introduction because one audio introduction you could do just the audio or you could do it with a slide. You don't have to be camera ready. Um, and sometimes I think for us we're um, dealing with some issues where we would prefer not to um, show our identities or, or our um, different things that would limit our power distance with our students. So something to be thinking about. All right, so um, we just touched on our, how we're going to um, think about supporting your students. And we also touched on some ways that you can think about delivering content. So um, we're gonna stop here and we're gonna do what's called the classroom assessment technique. John talked a little bit about formative assessment. So after you talk for a bit, um, you need to mix it up. So um, back in 2005, I did a huge, um, a multi-campus study on student response systems. I actually gave them that name. Um, more of you would know them as clickers. Um, but a way that you can use those to assess your students. So it's creating engagement through interactivity and you're actually learning about your students. So um, lots of them are called minute papers or muddiest points. These are by Angelo and Cross. They have a book called Classroom Assessment Techniques. We call them CATS. Um, not like the cats you wrangle, although I'm sure lots of us feel like we do that as well. So I want you to take a minute and think about what um, I was just sharing with you about content and student support. And I want you to um, either in the chat or just on a notebook in front of you, answer the question, what was the one thing about student support and or content delivery that you found to be exciting, intriguing, or unsettling? So I want you to identify the adjective and I want you to write the one thing uh, that you thought about it. And so again, I'm gonna give you one minute. You can, again, keep it to yourself or feel free to add it to the chat. And yes, silence is okay. And we're gonna have one minute of silence. All right, that's awesome. Um, probably 60 of you, if not more, shared in the chat. Please continue to do that. Um, back channel communication is always okay in these sorts of things where there's one way delivery. So the great thing about formative assessment or CATS is that you're able to identify, um, one, you're giving your students a chance to reflect by adding adjectives like exciting, intriguing, unsettling, you're actually adding emotion to um, that cognitive piece that they're reflecting on, which according to neuroscience will make us remember it more, okay? So you're taking a break from the content delivery, you're providing them with a piece of formative assessment. This will help them remember at least one piece of what you just talked about and put it into their memory. And it will be even deeper in their memory um, because I've added an adjective or emotional value to that piece. So um, this book of cats is huge. I was looking for it earlier and I couldn't find it. I literally was like bringing truckloads of books home from my office. Um, and I don't know where it is right now. But anyways, um, there are, if you just Google to Angelo and Cross classroom assessment techniques, lots of people have them on their website. So you can just go ahead and grab them. Again, the minute papers and the muddiest points, I think, are great. All right. So next, we're going to talk about learning activities. So we should right away sort of come in with the mindset of caring for our students. Um, we need to think about our content. We shouldn't just be doing, um, you know, hour-long lectures throughout the semester. Um, we should be uh, making those more engaging experiences by thinking about what type of media should we be using for different tasks and also incorporating formative assessment. I had this one colleague once 
who's given the same lectures for, um, you know, she's like, oh, I've been doing these lectures for 10 years. And she started integrating formative assessments um, and doing it with student response systems. And she's like, I never knew that my students weren't understanding that entire lecture because we don't find out until we give them like the first catastrophic exam. And then you find out like, oh, wow, you know, 60% of my students didn't understand Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and so when we have these catastrophic assessments, but we don't have formative assessments, the students aren't really learning. They're getting punished before they've gotten feedback on what they don't learn and had an opportunity to learn it. So super important. So as I was saying, my first experience was like, hey, I'm going to record myself lecturing. And then I was like, oh, wait, that's probably not effective um, strategies. I have to rethink this. And so um, then I started moving to learning activities. And so when I got to learning activities, which is one of the other keys in transforming your course, um, we need to start thinking about what am I going to have my students do online? You know, normally we have online, uh, we have some exams, we have some face-to-face -face discussions, maybe I broke them into groups for things um, to work on projects. And, um, but now how do I put all of this online? These discussions that we have with the large class, some of the smaller group um, activities, discussions or activities that they do, and it can be quite challenging. The great thing, as John had talked about, like there's so many better things about online, um, is online offers you, and especially when it's asynchronous, so not in real time, there's great things that you can do online that really facilitate deeper learning. Now, you can obviously have your students in a Zoom room or a collaborative, or um, I guess in a synchronous, video conferencing, um, do some collaborative discussions, but it's very hard once you get past a certain number to truly have all of the students participating in discussions in meaningful ways. Um, and that's where we see asynchronous discussions are really great. They also help with equity and access issues because they're low stakes technology, you don't need high bandwidth, and you don't have to be somewhere at the same um, time necessarily, and definitely not the same place. Um, but there's lots of other activities. Some, um, you know, as you guys know in the law field very well, uh, case study methodologies translate great online, especially in groups. And I'm gonna provide some examples of how you can do those as well. So there's lots of different things you can have your students do it, doing online. So the first week, I usually have it pretty focused on content development. So students are reading or they're listening to lecture, they're viewing websites um, or articles I've posted and those sorts of things. Um, I changed it to two week modules online because online modules when they're asynchronous, meaning not in real time, um, are a little bit of a challenge. And so by having two week modules, you can focus on a little bit deeper dive in the content and then actually more engaging um, at learning activities that are focused on peer interaction and instructor interaction in that second module. So I talked a little bit about large discussions. So the second week I have my students do a full class um, online discussion. This is not a large lecture class. There are some different considerations there. I usually break large lectures into smaller groups. Um, but I have all of my students in online asynchronous discussions within the LMS. They have very detailed prompts about what they have read or listened to or watched in week one in which they're supposed to respond. And the goal is for them to critically analyze and reflect on the conflict that they just consumed and have discussions with their peers, including critically analyzing their peers' responses to the content. What's very interesting is you have these magnificent opportunities of peer learning, which we would never see in the face-to-face -face classroom. So um, Jeremiah was talking about systematic soldiering, which is a concept we talk about in organizational studies. Jessica's like, oh my gosh, I totally didn't even understand that when I was reading it. Thank you for explaining that in more detail in this post. Now I totally get it. So you see that there's opportunities for ace and asynchronous discussions that you didn't necessarily see before. Now, in addition to having sort of this week of uh, heavy content and sort of this week of interacting with your, you know, students interacting with each other and interacting with you, you definitely have a role in those online discussions as well. I also have some other project-based learning that's going on. I really like project-based learning. 
Um, and so on every Sunday night, they have an individual project that's usually research-based. And then the following alternating Sunday, they are working on a group-based um, or team-based project that uh, they're broken into for the semester. Um, sometimes I do two of them, sometimes it's one over the semester. I'm just providing you some ideas about things you can do. So I'm gonna stop right there and tell you a story about how this approach I used for several years started going downhill. <laughs> so um, I found, you know, as you know, I was exploring my way through different forms of content, realizing my voice over PowerPoints were not so exciting. Um, really finding out that they loved audio introductions um, and video introductions to the course, to different modules and that sort of thing. They, wanna, they want some context and, and to know what's important, sort of like a verbal annotation to everything's going on. Otherwise, we were just like links, document, links, document. There's no sort of context there. We're not giving um, the bigger story. So um, also, as we all know, right, everyone questions online, oh, it's not as good, it's not as rigorous, um, which is interesting because, um, you know, overall, the meta analysis show us that it's just as good. Blend is actually better, but online is just as good as, if not better than face to face. Um, I used to teach this large lecture at Arizona State, which is where I actually started teaching um, my first online course. And, um, you know, I had 400 students. And I knew the first exam, 30% of them would fail. We would say, those aren't our comm majors. We're weeding them out. Um, and so it's not an effective instructional approach, obviously, for me to give 32 lectures and three exams. Um, yet, we question the rigor of online. I totally get it. It's wow. a technology. It's new. It should be questioned. Um, so with that, I was concerned about rigor. Maybe I need my students doing more. Um, and so I started tacking on lots of group activities. I think at one point I started having them do group activities almost every other week. Um, and so what happened is my course was not sort of the streamlined course anymore. Um, I started sort of tacking on different activities. And then on top of it, I got excited about some of the new things that were out there. It's like, oh, there's virtual worlds. I have to experiment with those. Um, and there's all of these other things. So guess what? More group more group, you know, because I figure in my face-to-face -face class, we do a new group project, or we do not a group project, we do group discussions every class. I'll just add on all the stuff. And I started doing group role plays and group um, simulations. And then what happened is um, two nights I didn't go to bed because I was upgrading, because you forget, you have to grade all of this stuff and you have to provide feedback. And the feedback is super important to their learning. So um, I took a step back, uh, probably around 2000, this was like 15 years ago, 2005, 2006, and was thinking like, I have to have a new approach to this. And that's when I started to learn about design. Uh, never did I necessarily think I was a designer. Um, you know, I escaped engineering school by the seat of my pants, thank goodness. My um, grandfather was not happy about that. Um, so I was like, I don't want to do design, but here we are, and who would have ever thought, thinking about our courses, that we would need to think about designing our instruction, designing the course, designing the learning. And so um, at first I started to think about, okay, what do I really want my students to be able to do at the end of this course? What do I want them to be able to remember six months from now or a year from now when they're in you know, their profession. Uh, majority of my students are grad, you know, seniors or graduate students. And so I ran into something called backwards design um, by Wiggins and McTeague. And so um, redesigning your course is one of the things we added to this sort of um, figure later in, in time, because we started to realize you really need to redesign what you're doing or design, because we have some people who would come to us that were just um, delivering their course. We actually ended up turning this into a faculty development program. We had about 100 faculty per year that came through this. Um, this has been delivered all over the world, Asia, um, Guatemala, um, Saudi Arabia. And so um, these are, are pretty consistent, but design was really important. And I came across Wiggins and McTeague backwards um, design. And so what the idea with backwards design is it was doing exactly what I was doing is I was trying to figure out what were my identified results. At the end of this, what do I want my students to be able to do? 
Then I learned what learning objectives and outcomes were. I didn't even know what those were. Um, you know, they didn't teach me those when I was working on my PhD. And then coming back from there, what is the evidence that I know that they've achieved these desired results? And that really ends up being your assessment. So we've always thought about content, right? You've got 16 chapters in your book. We're gonna do three exams, multiple choice items. We'll assess their knowledge and then we'll move on. Um, but then here, you know, we find out that there's a whole lot more we should be knowing about learning through interaction um, and authentic assessment and so forth. So by using this model, I was able to rethink my course, okay? Now fast forward and the research we conducted on several different factors that can statistically impact student outcomes through regression analysis, the number one predictor of student success, meaning they were learning, um, their satisfaction, and their grade in the course is design. So this is where, are you being clear about your learning objectives in the course? Are you being clear about how students will be assessed on achieving those learning objectives? And have you planned learning um, experiences and content that sort of align with all of those? And so rather than start at the content and go this way, we want to start at the desired results, backwards engineering, backwards design, and go this way. They use a very similar thing I've heard in um, product development and manufacturing um, and different things like that. But this was great. It's a great helpful tool Wiggins and McTeague put together. It's very practical. It's not like theoretical, um, how do people learn or it's not like Bloom's. It's a, a little bit more approachable. So this was really a great tool. Just this framework alone, I started rethinking my course. So remember I told you that problem, I just sort of was tacking on stuff to do because they need to be doing stuff online. What I found out is I had like five group decision-making activities. Decision-making in groups is very important. You guys will know this because I've used the movie, um, what's the 12 jury, the 12 hung jury, I'm losing my, um, you guys will know, somebody's- 12 problem. angry men. 12 angry men, yes. Um, there's lots of, you guys, there's, yeah, so I've used that before. It's a great video. You can have people watch and analyze. Um, but I had lots of this. So pretend I had people watching Apollo 13 and 12 Angry Men and all of these other things out there. And I wanted them to analyze those situations using five different models of decision making. Wow, why all of that? When all I really want my students to do is to be able to critically analyze the decision making process while applying the relevant theory and research. That's all I want them to do, but I keep making them do it over and over because I'm worried about rigor and I'm really excited that we can do all of these sorts of group activities online and I figured it out, but it wasn't very streamlined. And so I was assessing the same sort of learning objective multiple times um, and I didn't even realize it. So I actually went through my course and I redid everything using backwards design. Um, and this is just one example of what I did. I will share these slides and the recordings online so you don't have to write this stuff down, but you can go ahead and, and grab this as an example. So I knew what my desired results were. My acceptable evidence was if they were given a decision uh, making situation, you know, could they apply the information from the content, from the reading and lecture and so forth and understanding that process and identifying the contingencies that made it effective and ineffective. And then there was a learning activity. So I haven't even thought about content yet. You know, I'm just sort of thinking of these different things. At the end, you know, I wanted them to read about um, decision making and those sorts of things in the different forms. And then I had them watch a video of Apollo 13. So I put up a video chunk. The great thing about YouTube now is almost anything you want is available on YouTube that you can pull in your course to give them sort of a more authentic or real life. Um, in our research, students talk a lot about how they want authentic experiences, they want them to relate to real life and so forth. And so the students were able to um, go online and share in their analysis of that situation and they were able to respond to each other. Um, again, I know you guys use case studies a lot in the instructional approach for law. And so I did the same thing and in, um, in, I teach organizational studies. I also teach um, in management sometimes. And so um, case studies are something we use there often. We have tons of, of case study materials. And so that was the same thing. Um, having them work in groups on a project, the project was related to a case. So um, just sitting down and thinking about what are your, identif or, you know, identifying those desired results for the semester 
can really, that backwards design approach can really help you out, um, you know, rather than starting at the content. And I know we, you guys have a lot of content to cover, uh, but they, you know, the research tells us that the higher order learning um, actually requires students to know some of that basic recall knowledge in order to do the higher order learning. Um, so when you're asking, even in multiple choice questions, higher taxonomy items like problem solving and imper interpretive, you're actually assessing their basic recall knowledge. So that's just another um, example there. So you can give them a case study analysis. You can break them into teams. I usually recommend five to six people. Um, and then you can give them some discussion questions that as a team they can um, post online and then they would be required to um, provide feedback for one of the other teams. All right, so in our talk there about learning activities and then sort of my pivot to backwards design because no one wants to start with backwards design. I know that tends to be a little foreign. Um, please share with um, in the chat or just privately to yourself, what was the most unclear or confusing point in the discussion of backwards design and learning activities? And this is called the muddiest point, okay? So lots of times we'll give lectures to students and so forth, although I try um, not to lecture too much, except when I'm invited to do keynotes for groups of um, lawyers and professors. No. <laughs> so um, this is a great opportunity to do a quick check around the room. You can have students tweet this using a back channel. If you have a TA, they can aggregate sort of these unclear points, and then you can address them in an online discussion or at a later point. Um, just making sure, again, this is scaffolding learning. You're getting, giving them formative assessments, you're getting feedback, you're making sure they learn it before the catastrophic assessment um, or the larger summative assessment. And was somebody saying something? Oh, okay. I must be imagining things. <laughs> nope. I'm all, well, I think we're all muted so that we don't accidentally cough into the uh, audio okay. stream. <laughs> And now I know we started a little bit late, so I just wanted to check on time. Do we have 10 minutes for this last block or? Do we, we do. We do, okay. I just wanted to check and make sure. So yeah, these muddiest points in these minute papers are really great. Um, they're also really helpful in, when you have face-to-face -face classes or your blended class. So rather than, um, for example, saying like attendance, did you show up? Sort of thing. You can just have students fill these out and hand them in at the end of class. So it's great. One, you know they showed up at class. Two, you hope they listened. But three, you're able to identify the weaknesses in their learning and you can take an opportunity to address those weaknesses in your next face-to-face -face or online class. Um, and so I've just found, um, you know, I just feel like my students are learning so much better when I was able to integrate some of these things. All right. So I talked through our one minute, but I hope some of you got an opportunity to post those in the chat. All right, um, I'm gonna wrap up here talking a little bit assessment. So we talked about, um, obviously the number one thing you should be doing when you leave here is thinking about redesigning your course. You should um, have that mindset that you're gonna have empathy and care for your students. And when delivering your content, it's not just so easy as I'm gonna talk live to them. There's lots of options on that continuum. And there's actually, um, you know, for some of you, it's actually from the Daft and Lango Media Richness Theory from 1986 um, in the organizational, um, organization and management literature. So they did this whole study and a series of studies um, on media richness and what's appropriate for which organizational task. I just took that, I love theory. I just took that and applied it to more practical terms to designing courses. All right, so assessing students. Um, so we went through everything. We talked about developing activities in particular from backwards design. I'm gonna talk a little bit about assessing students. Although I feel like you guys have already had a little bit of a lesson here because you've got to have chance to see how formative assessment can work. Um, you guys have as a group and identified points that might be unclear to you or things, uh, you'll remember things probably leaving here a lot better. Um, because you, you know, put them back in your cognitive bank because you've already reflected on them or you've sort of attached some emotion to them. Um, cognitive neuroscience stuff, super interesting. I wish I had more time to read on it. When we're talking about assessing our students. Um, these are the different areas, again, from our research that we know that are important that are going to impact student outcomes. So obviously, that whole backwards design and aligning your assessments with learning out objectives is really important. And it actually increases not only the learning of the students, but it greatly increases the satisfaction of your students. 
Um, moving behind uh, beyond exam, I was a psychometrician um, in life at some point um, and developed exams for medical boards. So I understand the capacity of multiple choice items, different levels of taxonomy, what you're able to ass um, assess cognitive and behaviorally through those. Um, but we definitely know um, when we talk to corporate employers um, and when we talk to um, students um, that we need to move beyond exams. So we can have more formative forms of assessment. We need to have more project-based learning um, that leads to more authentic forms of assessment. So not just what do the students know, but are we preparing them for what they actually have to do um, when they leave school? Um, providing clear grading and expectations. A lot of time um, in, uh, in school in general, students are spending the time figuring out what they're supposed to be doing and how they're gonna be graded and um, what's an example of a good um, product. And so we need to really make sure to unpack that. Rubrics was this foreign word for me forever, but now I love rubrics. I've even created my own. It's, it's, um, it's very uh, fantastic because it helps you manage your workload and it helps unpack your expectations about, it brings up objectivity to your grading. The other thing is scaffolding, um, in particular in online. If you think you're gonna give your students nothing but lecture for eight weeks and then have them do an exam, I can guarantee to you that you're, well, I don't know, law school's a little different, but I can guarantee to you, you're gonna have a higher attrition and um, lower grades than you do otherwise because students will push time and they will keep pushing time. Um, and what will happen is they won't um, prep in time. So scaffolding is something that we know from the basics of even child development um, from 100 years ago. Um, but scaffolding is something that we can even use in higher ed and graduate schools and law schools. And that just means you're structuring the students learning every week. Every few days, they should be doing something. They should be getting feedback on it and so forth. And we're sort of um, going along the way there. So just a little tip on that. I mentioned briefly about the formative feedback. Another way I do formative feedback is that first week I told you they have a whole bunch of that content is that I, um, after they've done all the reading lecture, watching videos, looking at links, that sort of thing is I give them a quiz on that. Just like I was asking you guys some questions, I give them a quiz on everything they were supposed to consume and then I get results from that. And so here's an example. Um, this is a higher taxonomy item that I wrote. It's a scenario. So I'm not saying what is Maslow's needs, uh, safety need, define this, or which one of these is the definition. I'm giving them a scenario and they have to tell me which level this is. Well, this is fantastic because we learn about Maslow's hierarchy of needs probably in psychology, sociology, biology, and so forth. Um, they read about it. I probably talked a little bit about it in a lecture and only 36% of them, according to the p-value, got this item right. This is a problem. <laughs> so maybe they could give me the definition of safety, but they can't apply what they've learned in a real life situation. And so I needed to address that in the discussions. So using their quiz results, I go back into the discussion forum and guess what? These are the things we have to talk about because these had a p-value lower than a 0.6. That's problematic. So using randomized um, you know, item banks to assess whether they're getting the content or not, using that to identify to you maybe what they didn't learn from the reading, what wasn't clear, some of those textbooks we all know aren't great or different things that they read, they might have missed the point. So you're able to use formative assessment to go back in and use that to drive online discussions around these areas. And so again, um, you know, the real point is, is that you have to go through that backwards design. The assessment is the second piece of that. So once you have your desired results, of course, some of your assessments are probably going to be multiple choice exams or multiple choice items, but think more broader about how you can assess um, some of the higher order, um, you know, learning objectives, but also um, how you can give them formative assessment along the way so that they can make the corrections that they need to in their learning before they get to that sort of um, assessment that's going to hurt them. All right, so we have um, one more cat here before we wrap up. And so I want you to think about what was the most important thing that you learned during this session and what important question remains unanswered. So one, you're going to, after you write this, totally remember <laughs> the most important thing you learned today. And then the important question that remains unanswered, 
John and Deb are going to put together a future session. No, I'm just kidding. But at least now they will have an idea of uh, what sorts of potential future opportunities that you guys might enjoy um, based on those answers and or you can seek out opportunities that can give you those answers. You can also feel free to tweet me um, or email me and I will be more than willing to help you with um, any of these sorts of things. All right. Are we still chatting? I think my um, chat is just stuck at 99, and until I look at it, it's not going any higher. Uh, it's a little overwhelming. I've been trying to um, <laughs> curate some questions out of it into Q&A, but, uh, but Q&A has also um, uh, got quite a few questions. Um, Before but, we but get to you... questions, I just want to just want to drive this home and then we'll break. But just remember, um, if anything, leaving here, I have a checklist for course redesign, again, on my blog. Um, get the 10 questions that will help you think about your course for the fall. Get the checklist. I have a checklist for the overall course design that was based on some of the quality rubrics that are out there. I have a checklist for developing a, a learning module, a checklist for developing your assessment plan, a checklist for your syllabus. I really like checklists. Um, and I use them every semester myself just to remind me. So these areas are super important. Um, in the research that we did, I shared with you the fact that design and organization was over 70% predicting outcomes um, with regression analysis. We also know that learner support was very um, influential in that as well. And so these are, are different areas that we know statistically um, impact student outcomes. And, uh, and just to drive it home again, make sure to think about backwards design, okay? So what do you want your students to be able to do? Not just do you want them to know or understand. What do you want them to be able to do at the end of your semester? Just a nice uh, a thinking there. A little takeaway um, also is we've um, consolidated a bunch of our research in this fun one-page infographic, which um, highlights some of the points I talked about. And you can grab that at tinyurl.com slash data, which is, um, I'm from the National Research Center of Distance Ed and Tech Advancements. I know it's a mouthful, so that's why we call it um, data, D-E-T-A, um, quality indicators. And again, this will be available for you, um, but please feel free uh, to download that and um, use that when you're going through your redesign process. All right, and so I will turn it over to John and Deb um, if you guys have any questions. Oh, ho, 412. So we officially have uh, three minutes left in the class, but um, <laughs> um, let, let, let's, let, let's pick a few questions and, um, and, and sort of see how we go. Um, geez. Um, yeah, I'm going to go, can go I, ahead. Can I jump in? Because there have been a, a, a lot flying by about, is this recorded? Are we going to get your slides? Yes to all of that. Um, Absolutely. We can all watch this over and over. Personally, I'll be binge watching this for the next few Saturdays. This was awesome. Thank you, Tanya. Yeah, you're welcome. God, you got some substance here. Thanks, Tanya. Um, yeah, geez, I'll just jump in. A um, couple of people, um, it, this is almost a meta question. The problems of nomenclature. Um, you know, uh, you, you, you threw a lot of new words at us uh, uh, and, and, and people are confused about hybrid, flex, blended, you know, is, is, is the nomenclature settled or is that just part of being involved in instructional design that it, it's a, it's a uh, bit of a moving target? Yeah, so I'm not going to answer your question, but I'm going to tell you a story that will answer your question. Um, I chaired um, what used to be called the Sloan Consortium. It's now called the Online Learning Consortium Blended Conference for a couple of years. And um, we decided to bring back um, the idea of defining blended learning. So there actually is a published article in the Journal of Asynchronous Learning Networks from 2005 from my colleague Anthony Picciano, um, who talks about the definition of blended learning. Um, and, and as I said before, blended learning and hybrid learning are the exact same thing. It's just that the Sloan Foundation gave millions of dollars and didn't like the word hybrid because it represented a car and they wanted it called blended. Um, so here we were um, seven years later with a group of 100 people showed up to talk about <laughs> defining blended learning. Um, and so it was interesting because we had identified new characteristics and so forth, but at this you know, end of the day, it was still sort of same, the same course. So you can feel free to jump into that journal article or, or email me and I'll get it to you. It's actually um, on, the, on my blog probably. 
Now fast forward, do you guys remember when flipped learning came? Um, it was like K-12 and science instruction had found flipped learning and it was a brand new type of instructional approach and it was gonna be great. And I was asked again to host a um, workshop on flipped instruction. Um, and it was around defining what is flipped instruction. And what I found out is that 90% of the time, blended, flipped, and hybrid are exactly the same. Um, and so in flipped instruction, it's pretty much when you take your lectures and you put them online and you use the face-to-face -face time for more interactive activities. So um, for the most part, hybrid, blended, um, and flipped, and high flex to some degree all mean the same thing. There's a blending of online and face-to-face -face potentially and or blended of synchronous and asynchronous. So um, that is the response in a nutshell. That's awesome. That's, a, that's, a, that's my experience as well. And every program, I think to define it for your people. Um, that's something we did come up with, yeah. Let, let me hit you with a practical question. Come up, okay. came, comes up a lot. Um, a lot of the law professors are seeing that they're going to probably go back and do some face-to-face -face teaching, but they think that they might end up then being chased out of their classrooms. What yeah. hap how, how do you design for the fact that you're going to do some face-to-face, -face, some online, or, or, or whatever the mixture might be? Yeah, I think that goes back to that content continuum I shared um, and thinking about, I, I really love Daft and Lango when thinking about this but what really needs to be face-to-face, -face, okay? If you are lecturing, I don't think that needs to be face-to-face, -face, although I appreciate having a bunch of students standing in front of me because I'm much more energetic and charismatic, and I am not so much <laughs> when I am, you know, talking through a, a Zoom uh, webinar. Um, and so as much as, you know, we like to do um, lecture and talk to large groups of students, I think you need to think about what, what I always think about is why would my students need to be face to face? Do they have to connect with each other? Why are they connecting with each other? What are things that are difficult to do online? Um, those are the sorts of things. So, you know, um, are there some things that are just hard to do online? Uh, and I'll talk to university general because I am not, uh, I don't think I have enough knowledge of law schools. Um, but in general, you know, it's hard to do biology labs online. So people might keep that face to face. It's hard to do, um, you know, the um, saxophone rehearsals online sometimes. So maybe those stay face to face. I'm sure for me, it's my, um, sometimes my project based learning, I would prefer to come together in my blended class and keep that face to face. Um, but definitely, um, my word of advice is to definitely prepare for your course to either be online or to end up going online in a remote instruction situation at some point in the fall. All right. Let's, let's how about one more question yeah. because I, and, and there's dozens more and I apologize folks yeah, that we can't, if, um, can't get to everything. Yeah, if you guys want to, and I should mention everyone can throw them on Twitter. On Twitter, I'm at T. Justin and I'll answer your question or email we'll, me we'll, we'll, or get them to dub. And we'll, and right. We'll take a stab at, at, at sort of curating and collating yeah. um, in, in the course materials or on the discussion boards. Yeah, so um, say, we, have, we have a record. Hi, this is Omar. We have, we do a record of all the questions. And so um, yeah, awesome. we'll do some sort of curated thing so that we can try and get some of these answered. Yeah, maybe I'm, we could put I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, you. Exactly, exactly. I'm gonna end with, a, with an eminently practical sort of sounding question, but you can go wherever you want with this. I'm not totally sure how you reduce the amount of grading you do when you increase the amount of assessments. Yeah. I'm assuming we're talking yeah. formative assessments here. Um, you know, uh, everybody, we're already redesigning our courses and we got to do a whole bunch of more work on top of it. Yep. Yeah. So, um, assessment is an issue because it does increase, oh, I just got my glasses. It does increase your workload and we didn't get to the managing workload on that tree. Um, but what I tell you is two things. One, um, using rubrics is really helpful and there's lots of information out there for that. But also what I would say is I do a lot of zero, one, two, um, and we do that too. Um, we, if you're interested, I'm teaching right now a course on edX, on pivoting online um, with my colleague, George Siemens and some others. But Love what we George. do there is it's, yeah, it's sort of zero, one, two. So like if you don't try it at all or the learner doesn't try, they get a zero. If they sort of tried but didn't really hit the mark, they get a one. And if it was great, they get a two. 
Um, so it really depends on, you want to give them feedback on the richer things, but on some of the basic stuff, it doesn't need to be elaborate. It can be very as simple as, you know, zero, one, two. Also, it's a great time to talk to your university about additional grading support. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Uh, it's 420. We've gone five minutes over. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Tanya. That was dense. And uh, I have a feeling we'll be processing that for a while. Um, we'll, we'll do our best to collate things and, and, and get materials out. Um, Deb, is there any other housekeeping that we need to handle? No, that's what the discussion forum is for. Our, uh, I invite everyone to go. Tanya, thank you so, so much. You brought up a lot more questions than you answered, I think, which is a, a great hour spent. Thank you. All right, folks. See you on Thursday. Bye-bye.